I think we have some good numbers of people now, uh, don't you? So next slide, please. So I think we can we can start the seminar. Um, okay, thanks um, everybody for uh, um, coming to this uh, seminar series. My name is uh, Daniel Rodriguez. I'm a professorial research fellow with the Center for Crop Sciences. And today we are going to be listening to Dongshu Zhao uh, on, on her postdoctoral work. Next. We do the acknowledgement of country, the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Next. Um, today's seminar is scheduled from 12 to 1 p.m. And at the end, we are going to have uh, some questions and answers. I do please ask you to put your questions on the Q and A uh, key at the bottom of the page, not on the on the chat box. Um, okay, thanks for that. Next. Um, so Dong Shu is a postdoctoral research fellow. Uh, she researches uh, crop soil relationships, particularly sensing soil water and crop water use. She uses uh, digital agriculture tools to predict the spatial variation of soil properties and their impact on crop growth and yield. She uses simulation modeling, machine learning, linear mixed models, wavelet analysis, progression creating, and numerical clustering to analyze the data. Um, so Dong Shu, please, the floor is yours. You can start your seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Dong Shu Zhao, and today I'm going to present a study on 3D characterizations of crop water use and the routing system in field agronomic research. The ongoing climate change um, has increased the intensity and the frequency of heat and drought events in Australia. And this has increased the vulnerability of farming and the urgency to optimize crop designs for increased adaptation. Phenotyping plays a key role in improving the crop climate adaptability as it can provide essential information on how genetics, uh, the environmental pressures and management can guide the selection towards productive crops suitable to their environment. Techniques for phenotyping are rapidly advancing, particularly with the widespread availability of proximal sensors, the use of drones and the high resolution satellite imagery and the development in machine learning and uh, the artificial intelligence for data analysis. However, so far, most of the phenotyping works have focused on characterizing the above ground parts of the crop and ignoring the head and half, the rooting system and its activity due to a lack of efficient sensing tool. Recently advances in the geophysical, oh, sorry, um, the opaque nature of soils have limited the root phenotyping works to mainly grow plants in controlled environments, such as chambers or pots, which are difficult to simulate the real in field environment or soil conditions. And even in some cases, 
significantly alter the root architecture and its function. So the field studies on characterizing the crop root system and its activity are essential to provide more information on how each variety adapts to its environment. In the field, the soil coloring method is the most commonly used approach for assessing the crop root. But this method is destructive, expensive, and extremely time consuming when hundreds of plots need to be assessed. And this approach also has a large uh, uncertainty because just a small portion of the root is collected by the soil core to represent the large root systems. So there is a need for developing a low cost, repeatable and rapid approach for characterizing the crop root system and its activity in the field. Recently, advances in the geophysical techniques have offered opportunities to rapidly infer the root growth and activity through monitoring the changes in the soil moisture profiles instead of quantifying roots. For example, the neutron probe, the time domain reflectometry, electrical resistivity tomography, ground penetrating radar, and the electromagnetic induction, EM. The neutron probe and the TDR measurements are point-based, in which just a small volume of the soil is assessed. In comparison, the ERT, GPA, and EM approach could provide continuous measurements to enable the 2D or 3D screening of the soil moisture. But the ERT approach requires extensive electrical cabling, and the GPA require, has a large prediction uncertainty when the highly conductive clay-rich soils are considered. In contrast, the EM approach is more convenient and more accurate. This is because the EM sensors are contactless and can be tuned behind vehicles to rapidly generate spatial dense data set across a large trail. And the EM sensors mirror the soil apparent electrical conductivity, ECA, which is a proxy of soil moisture. And the EM sensors usually consist of um, one transmitter at one end, emitting magnetic field into the soil, and one or multiple receivers at another end, receiving the soil responses from different soil depths. In the EM sensor, an alternating current is introduced into the transmitter coil. And the alternating current in the transmitter will induce a primary magnetic field into the soil. As the primary magnetic field passes through the soil, the eddy currents will be generated in the soil conductors. The eddy currents then generate a secondary magnetic field into the receiver. And the ratio between the first and secondary uh, magnetic field, fields were used to calculate the soil ECA. The EM sensed the ECA is influenced by the surface charge on the clay minerals and the clay particles, and also influenced by the concentrations of ions in the soil solutions. So the ECA is determined by a combination of soil properties including the clay type, clay content, soil moisture, and the soil salinity. Because the soil properties such as the clay type and the clay content are more time stable comparing to the soil moisture. 
So by conducting the time lapse EM service, it will enable a distinguishment of soil moisture effects on the ECA from the effects of other more time stable soil properties, such as clay type. So this will enable the EM approach to be used to predict the soil moisture content and the changes in the soil moisture profile. There is a large range of uh, EM sensors available commercially. For the agricultural and soil investigations, the EM38, EM31, CMB Mini, and Julium series instruments are commonly used. All of these sensors support GPS communication and data logger, and they all have multiple receivers arranged in different combinations, in different configurations or orientations, which enable uh, this sensor to collect the soil responses from multiple soil depths. However, the sensors on the left hand side require to be operated in two different modes, including the horizontal and the vertical modes. In comparison, the Julian instruments are more convenient to be used because it just has one operating mode, which enable it to finish data collection over one pass of the sensor. Among the Julium sensors, the Julium 21S is the most suitable uh, instrument for characterizing the crop root system. It's because this sensor have four receivers, which enable it to collect soil responses from four different depths at the crop root zone between zero to three meters. So this Julium 21S uh, was applied in our project. In this study, we aim to answer if EM could be used to produce the 3D characterizations of sorghum water use and root function with depths, and also to explore if combining the 3D soil moisture dynamics with the satellite imagery and the simple crop ecophysiological principles could be used to untangle the complex G by E by M interactions in SOGO. This study was conducted at a large SOGO trial at Norway, Queensland in the 2020 summer growing season. And this trial covers an area of 3.2 hectare. And with the soil type being mainly clay rich water source. And the treatments were laid out in a split plot design replicated three times and included three times of sowing, winter, spring, and summer, and two water treatment levels, including the rain feed and supplementary irrigation, six commercial hybrids, and four plant population densities. And this laid out generated 432 plots across the trail. And the combination of three times of sowing and two water level, uh, water treatment levels exposed the sorghum crops to a large diverse range of growing stages. Here is the EM sensing system used in this study. And this uh, is developed by my colleague, Joe and Peter. And the, in this system, the Julium 21S uh, is secured in a PVC tube placed uh, on the ground. And that was tilled three meters to the right of the body. And the control arm, the, the, uh, the lens of the control arm could be adjusted to enable the EM sensor to collect the soil responses from different crop rows. And the height of the control arm could also be adjusted to place the EM sensor at a different height, height uh, above the ground 
to provide more resolutions of the soil moisture information with depth. The one camera was installed at the top of the satellite system to get the driving directions and to avoid any influence on the crops. And aircon was also uh, installed to provide the cooling air to the PVC tube to reduce the temperature effect on the EM readings. And one Trimble GPS uh, is also installed in the system for uh, georeferencing the ECA data to uh, longitude and latitude. The EM sensing system traversed uh, the trail along 12 parallel transects to collect uh, continuous uh, soil ECA data. And uh, the buggy was driven at a, at a speed of four kilometers per hour, which enabled it to collect around four EM readings per plot. And in total, uh, there were around 2,300 EM readings collected across the whole trail for each of the EM survey. And based on the range of collected soil ECA data, and totally uh, 24 soil sampling locations were selected across the, the trial along two transects. And the soil cores up to three meters with 0.3 meter increments were collected. And the gravel metric water content of these samples were uh, measured in the, in the laboratory. Uh, for calibrating the EM sensed the ECA data to the soil moisture data. To test the EM approach, two continuous EM surveys on the 4th and 14th of December were selected. This period uh, covers a wide range of the sorghum growing stages, including the flowering period for the uh, winter sown sorghum, one week before flowering for the uh, spring sown sorghum, and uh, four weeks after the sowing of the summer uh, sorghum. And in this period, there, is, there were, was also no significant rainfall or irrigation happened. So which means the changes in the soil moisture profile were driven as a crop water use. The EM sensed ECA data is a, a depth weighted value uh, representing the conductivity of a bulk volume of soil, so which have limited the previous studies to predict one average soil moisture uh, value across the whole soil profile. And this has led to a missing of uh, soil moisture information with depths. So in this study, to enable the EM approach to predict the depth specific soil moisture content for understanding the crop uh, water use and the root activity with depth, a one dimensional literally constrained technique termed as quasi-3D inversion was applied to invert the depth weighted ECA to depth-specific true soil electrical conductivity, sigma. After converting the soil ECA to sigma, an artificial neural network model was developed uh, by considering the sigma as covariate to predict the soil moisture content at each of the soil layer across the whole trail on the two survey dates. Then the water flux at each of the soil layer um, on the two survey dates were calculated to represent the crop water use with depth. And at the same time, the uh, plot level soil evapotranspiration between 0 to 1.5 meters were also uh, calculated to represent the crop water use at a plot level. And then a linear mixed model and a regression tree model uh, were applied 
to untangle the GBA um, interactions on the crop water use at both plot level and across depth level. In addition, a root factor uh, was also calculated uh, in this study to represent the presence of roots with soil depth. By considering the crop water use and initial soil moisture content predicted from the EM approach and the crop water demand represented by the NDVI values derived from the satellite imagery uh, in the EM survey, uh, surveying period. And the figure A uh, shows the calibration R squared for the developed artificial neural network model uh, when different uh, combinations of the parameters for inverting the soil ECA uh, was considered. So the largest uh, calibration R squared was uh, achieved uh, at around 0.8 for calibration. And the file false cross validation and independent validation uh, was used to evaluate the AM performance. And the results indicate that the developed uh, artificial neural network model could provide accurate uh, soil moisture predictions across depths, given a high R square and low, low root mean square error values. So the developed artificial neural network model was used to predict the soil moisture content at each of the soil layer on the two survey days. And here are the special distribution of the predicted soil moisture uh, at each of the depths at the two survey days. And based on these maps, we can conclude that the predicted soil moisture was consistent with the layout of irrigation and TOS treatments. For example, as the upper row, which are the soil moisture maps on the 4th of December, the largest top soil moisture content was observed as the TOS3 treatments, because uh, at that stage, uh, that's, that is the vegetative stage, the crop had, had a very small, uh, had a small uh, crop water demand uh, and there was no water limitations. And the next the largest uh, um, topsoil moisture content was observed as the TOS1 and TOS2 irrigated treatment um, because the large water availability. And in comparison, the smallest crop water use was observed as the TOS1 and TOS2 dry land treatments due to the water stress. And as the deeper layer, uh, the soil most the special distribution patterns of the soil moisture uh, were similar to the topsoil, but the soil layers were generally drier. After 10 days, the special distribution patterns of the soil moisture was still similar to that on the 4th of December, but the soil moisture profiles across the whole trail were generally dried, ex especially between the depths. Uh, at a depth between zero to one meter. Based on the predicted soil moisture maps on the two uh, survey days at each of the soil layer, the water flows uh, with depths were calculated to represent the crop water use in this uh, survey period. And here are the special distribution of the calculated uh, water flows Based on these maps, we can conclude that the combination of time of sowing and irrigation produced large changes in the crop water use and soil water dynamics. For example, at the top uh, 0.8 meter soil layers, the largest crop water use was observed at the TOS1 and TOS2 irrigated treatments due to the large crop water demand and large water availability. And the next largest crop water use was observed as a TOS3 treatment is due to the small crop water demand. And in comparison, 
the smallest crop what we use was observed at the TOS1 and TOS2 dry land treatments is due to the water stress. And the same concurrence could be derived at all the three replicates. And at, the, at a deeper depth, it's below 0.8 meters. The smallest crop water use was observed as a TOS3 treatment. And it's because the shallow rooting depths. And interestingly, the TOS1 and TOS2 dry land treatment had an equivalent or even larger crop water use than the corresponding TOS1 and TOS2 irrigated treatments, which indicates that the crop roots at dry land treatment at around flowering are more active at, with depth. And here is the plot level soil evapotranspiration uh, calculated from the soil moisture maps are uh, predicted from the YAM approach to represent the plot level crop water use. And based on this map, we can conclude that across the trial, the ET values showed a large variation and which was driven by the G by E by M combinations. For example, the largest crop water use at the plot level were observed as the TOS1 and the TOS2 irrigated treatments due to the large crop water demand and the large water availability. And the next largest crop water use at plot level was observed at the TOS1 and TOS2 dry land treatment with a value ranging between four to six millimeter per day. And in comparison, the smallest uh, uh, crop water use at plot level were observed at TOS3 treatment due to the small crop water demand with a value ranging between two to four millimeter per day. A linear mixed model uh, was applied to entangle the G by E by M interactions on the plot level ET. And the results indicated that there was significant TOS by irrigation by density interactions on the plot level ET. For example, at the flowering stage and at the dry land treatment, the smallest uh, crop population densities had the largest crop water use at the plot level. This is because the larger plant population densities has already dried the soil profile at the early growing stages. Well, the opposite was true as a corresponding uh, irrigated treatment in which the larger plant population densities generally had a larger crop water use at plot level. It's because there was no water limitations. And at the vegetative stage, generally larger plant population densities had larger crop water use at plot level. And the linear mixed model analysis also indicates that there was significant TOS by irrigation by genotype interactions. For example, at the uh, flowering stage, at the dry land treatment, there were no significant genetic differences on the crop water use still to the water limitation. And well, at the corresponding irrigated treatments, the genotype C and I consistently had hair ET values. And at the vegetative stage, uh, there were no significant genetic differences uh, in the ET values, regardless of water levels. And the regression tree uh, model was also used uh, to entangle the G by E by M interactions on the plot level ET. 
and the results indicated that at the flowering period, the plot level ET values ranged between a value less than two millimeter per day to eight millimeter per day. And the largest ET value was obtained at the large plant population density and at dry land treatments with two genopaps, C and F. And at the vegetative stage, the ET values were much smaller comparing to the flowering stage with a value ranging between one to four millimeter per day. And with the ET values mainly driven by the large plant population densities. To understand the sorghum water use with depths and the crop and the root activities uh, with at the across depth level, the soil moisture profiles were plotted on the two survey dates for one reference genotype E by considering three times of soil, two water levels, and four plant population densities. And from this graphs, we can conclude that at around flowering time and at the dry land treatments, the crop water use mainly happened at a depth between 0.5 to 1.5 meters. While at the corresponding irrigated treatments, the crop water use was mainly happened at a depth between 0 to 1.3 meters. At the vegetative stage, the crop water use was mainly happened at a depth between 0 to 0 0.5 meters, regardless of the water levels. The linear mix model was also used to untangle the G by E by M interactions on the crop water use represented both by the water flask uh, at across depth level over the 10 days. And the results indicated that there were significant interactions between the G by E by M and the soil depths. And from this complex graphs, we can simply derive several key messages. First, water use was deeper for the dry land and especially for the winter and spring sown sorghums. Secondly, canopy size explained the water use across time of sowing and plant population densities. Thirdly, vertical water movement was observed for the deepest layers, especially for the dry land, uh, for the irrigated treatments. And fourthly, two hybrids had significantly higher water use across most depths. They are C and I. In this study, a uh, root factor was also successfully derived uh, to represent the root activity and presence uh, at each of the soil layers. By considering the crop water use and initial soil water content predicted from the EM approach and the crop water demand represented by the NDVI values. And here are the special distribution of the calculated R. Generally, um, this, this graph shows that the, uh, the calculated R was consistent with the ecophysiological understanding on the crop routine depths and its activity. For example, as the dry land treatment, uh, the crop routine depths is larger, it's deeper than that at the irrigated treatment. And this graph also shows that the calculated R has a large variation 
across the whole trail and also uh, across the solid dust. Th this is uh, this was driven by the Jibaiba um, interactions. So to untangle the Jibaiba um, interactions on the calculated uh, root factor R, the linear mix model was applied, and the results indicate that there were significant interactions between Jibaiba um, and soil dust. The treatment and the crop stages affected the value of R. As you throw the water supply or water demand driving factors. For example, the dry land treatment had larger R values for the lower plant population densities. While the opposite was true in the corresponding irrigated treatment, especially at the around flowering period. And this conclusion could be derived from multiple uh, depths. And again, the hybrid F had a larger value of R when the water was less limiting. From this study, we can conclude that the EM can be used to rapidly and cheaply characterize the soil available water and the crop water use and the ET across large trails. And the measurement errors are small as the sense the volume of soils is enormous. And the EM approach could capture the known J by E by M interactions. And a root activity factor could be derived to represent the presence of active roots at different soil layers across the soil profile. This new developed technology could be used for 3D characterizations of soil water availability and crop water use to inform the irrigation application in the field and also could be used to uh, identify the special and temporal variability of subsoil constraints. It can also be used to optimize combinations of G by E by M. It can also be used to identify the mechanisms of the drought tolerance in the field in the breeding programs. Thanks for the listening. And we would like to acknowledge the GRDC for their financial support for conducting uh, this research. Thank you. Thank you, Dongzhu. And, um, and now uh, the floor is open uh, to questions. Um, still, I don't see questions coming. So um, just to kick start, I'll ask Dongzhu a question myself. Um, so Dongzhu, just a simple question for you. So what do you think uh, gonna be the next uh, steps in the analysis of this uh, very large uh, and complex uh, data set? So what is, um, what is it you're planning to do next? Like what is gonna be your next paper? Yeah. So here uh, we presented uh, uh, the, it's a methodology study. So we, in this study, we developed a, a methodology for characterizing the crop root water use and activities with depths in the field. So next step, we are going to use this technology to characterize the crop water use across the whole growing season, not just the 10 days period. We want to see the crop water use with depths across the whole growing season. And maybe look, uh, even look at uh, each of the growing stages uh, specifically to see uh, what's the root activity differences uh, between each of the growing stages. And also we want to couple the EM uh, 
sense the crop water use data with the root with the root uh, observed root uh, data in the field from the soil coring method to see if the EM derived root factors and crop water use uh, information could be used to derive some root uh, root trees like root loss density or uh, root volume or some other trees could be uh, linked together and also to want to see what's the relationship between the EM sensed the soil moisture at the below ground part. Uh, what's the relationship between the EM sensed the soil moisture data with the above ground part of the crop yield? Yeah, these are the three uh, aspects that we want to look at. Okay, thank you, Dongshu. Um, I have a question from uh, Getika, and uh, she wants to know what are the hybrids uh, C and F that are, are looking to be uh, behaving a bit different than the other ones? Can you tell us what yeah. are those hybrids? Um, the C is crackle, and the F is centennial. And centennial. Centennial, yeah. And the crackle is uh, I think it's a medium maturity grain. It's similar to a bus this buster. And the centennial is a medium long maturity. Yeah. Um, okay. Here's a question um, also from Barbara. She's asking, um, you, you said that the canopy size explained uh, the G by E by M interactions. Uh, but how did you measure canopy size? Yeah, so here, uh, the canopy size, actually we, we derived the canopy size information from the satellite, uh, from the NDVI values, derived from the satellite images. And um, in which we observed that the TOS1 and TOS2 had a similar, a similar NDVI values across the whole trail because they are at the similar growing stages. The TOS1 is at the flowering period and TOS2 is approaching the one week before the flowering period. So the canopy size are quite similar we get the information yeah. from the NDVI uh, data. Yeah, uh, sat satellite and proximal sensing was very much used to, to determine canopy size across these trials. Um, they have, there's another question here from um, John Dixon. Uh, and um, he's, uh, he wants to know if there are low cost uh, EMI devices that could be used uh, um, in across low income countries like in Southeast Asia by agricultural uh, researchers or private agronomy advisors? Yeah, um, I think the EM38. EM38, uh, the price is much uh, cheaper. And uh, I also have some colleagues in Thailand and they the EM sensor, EM38 are the most commonly used uh, sensors in uh, Thailand. Maybe it's also the similar, similar uh, recommendation could be given to other uh, developing countries that uh, given the EM38 usually also have a similar uh, sensing depth to Julian. Uh, Julian 1, uh, one uh, is, is have two channels provide uh, so easy data from two depths between zero to 1.7 uh, and zero to 1.5 meters. So, and also based on the literature, so the EM38 performed very good on predicting the soil moisture content at the root zone. Just the EM38 operator is not that convenient to comparing to the uh, Julium sensors. Thank you, Dongshu. 
Uwe, Uwe Grever is asking, um, what is the potential for, for the use of that technology to increase the temporal precision in detecting crop water stress? Um, yeah, I think this technique has a large potential on um, um, providing some help to characterize the water limitations or something like that because this method could provide 3D characterizations of the crop water availability at different at at both plot level and uh, at across depth level. So you can identify where is the water stress happened and how much water you should put in for irrigation and where you should put in. And uh, there is uh, another question uh, asking whether you need to calibrate uh, these equipment for each type of soil. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. Actually, this the the model developed here is an artificial neural network model. It's a it's an empirical model. It's a field best. So, if you have it, um enough budget to collect the soil cores it's better to calibrate one uh to calibrate the field best empirical models which means that you better to calibrate uh, one model for each of the field but uh, one of my colleagues they are doing uh, a research on collecting this soil easy the EM data from different fields, different soil types, and different locations across Australia, and pull the collected soil ECA data together to build a Julian library, data library, and use uh, deep learning to, to train a deep learning model. And it shows that this uh, developed the big deep learning model by considering so many uh, soil types perform acceptable when it used to predict the soil properties at a different uh, field. But I think it's, for soil moisture, it's better to calibrate a, a field-based model because the soil moisture is highly dy dynamic comparing to other soil properties. And they also have a large variation uh, with depth and also uh, at different, vary with, has a highly dynamic special. Yeah. Okay, um, we don't have many, any more questions. Any more questions uh, people would like to, to put to Dongshu? So, Dongshu, just um, when, when you use the equipment, um, uh, you have shown um, that you put the sensor in the middle of the plot and that you have five, um, five readings. Uh, as the sense of travels within the plot. If you want to, if you want to have a, a better precision and higher precision on on the, what is happening within the routing system in each in each of the plots, could you could you could you pass pass the sensor across different on different rows uh, or multiple rows? And, and how beneficial would that be just to increase uh, capacity to detect uh, differences? So do we know that or do we have to do that? Yeah, uh, actually now our plot is six meter by 10 meter uh, is the size of our plot. And we have five, five EM readings. Uh, actually, I looked at the five uh, EM readings they um they are quite same so which means there is not large variations within each of the plot which means we are successfully control the the consistency of the soil moisture within the plot right so if we want more resolution of the soil moisture within plot i think we drive slow to collect more points if if there are some differences in the soil moisture within the plot expected. 
So we just just slow to capture more points. And yeah, it's the same for the row. If they're expected some moisture difference between the rows within the plot, we could put the YAM at different rows uh, to see if there are any differences uh, between the multiple row analysis and the one row analysis. It's depend on the intention and also okay. the, the, the size of the plot. Um, I don't see any other questions coming. So um, uh, there is one. Oh, great talk. Okay. Uh, thank you. And um, yes, are, are you are you also thinking of uh, linking um, the the readings and the and the data sets that you are collecting with the DOLM? Uh, to test and, uh, and improve crop models. So do you think that is there is a scope for that? Yeah, I think definitely there are something we can do because here the EM uh, provided the soil moisture at, at each of the plot and with a depth uh, from zero to three meters. So we have plenty uh, data available across the whole soil profiles for the soil moisture data. So I think it can be used to, to provide some information for the absin uh, to simulate the crop roots and uh, crop water use with depths. Because our EM also conducted across the whole growing season. And with so many, so much data, uh, 3D soil moisture data and across the whole growing season. I think definitely it can provide a, a data set uh, to uh, modify or give some clue on developing the, the absent root, uh, the, the, the algorithm for signaling the root system in absent maybe. I think it's uh, also going to be interesting, Dong Shu, when we receive um, the new the new cameras are going to go on the drone. It's going to be able just to give us uh, thermal banks, so we're going to be able just to uh, relate uh, water use and 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 canopy temperature uh, pretty directly and and very much uh, measure everything. All the, all the terms in the penman monteith equation, uh, which is um, is going to be really interesting. So it's a nice piece of gear. It's not cheap, but it's, it's a really good piece of gear. Um, I see Uwe asked the same question I asked about Absin. Uh, so, sorry, Uwe, I, I beat you. Um, if there is no more questions, um, I would like to, to thank uh, Dong Shu for a great presentation. And uh, Dong Shu, if you can click the next slide. Mm -hmm. And um, so the next uh, seminar uh, is by the Donald uh, Gardner on new tricks to manage uh, wicked plant diseases. So please make a booking for that uh, May the 31st uh, to listen to another great talk. And um, well, I would like to. There is another slide next to to this, uh, Dong Shun. Yes, and uh, and if you want to follow up on all the seminar activity uh, in Quafi, uh, scan these uh, uh, QR codes, and also if you want to give feedback uh, on our twenty twenty one seminars, uh, you can do that on the on the other QR. Uh, code on the on the right hand side and um yeah thank you for for your participation and your questions and uh good job